Okay, we'll move to um, item number 26, Public Works presentation on Little Sarasota Bay by David Tomasco, HD Executive Director of Sarasota Bay Estuary Program, and I believe Spencer Anderson will get us started. I don't think, I don't think we have a limit on time here, do we? Oh, is there time? <laughs> really? That's a, no. We're, we're, yeah, let's, let's, we'll probably try to keep this to no more than 30 minutes if we can, sir. Good morning, Commissioners. Spencer Anderson, Public Works Director. Uh, today we're here to talk about uh, the strategic action item, Health of the Bay, particularly Little Sarasota Bay. Uh, in February, uh, we had brought information to the board uh, talking about potential options for uh, looking at a new opportunity with the, the Midnight Pass area uh, that kind of centers itself on Little Sarasota Bay. Uh, we asked for the board for some direction and through that conversation, uh, the request was made to request uh, the executive director of the Sarasota Bay Estuary Program, Dr. David Tomasco, to come and speak with you. And he is here today to do that and so I welcome him up here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. Uh, for the record, my name is Dave Tomasco. I'm the director of the Sarasota Bay Estuary Program. Um, and uh, this, for those unfamiliar with it, um, we are a special independent district in the state of Florida. Uh, we receive about 70% of our funding from the federal government, but we're, the rest of our money comes from local governments, including you guys. Thank you very much. And uh, we have a committee structure, a citizens advisory committee with a couple of dozen members. Uh, we have a technical advisory committee with several dozen members with a combined experience in Sarasota Bay of well in excess of 100 years. I think it's like a couple of centuries. I've been working in Sarasota Bay on and off for about 30 years myself. Um, and then we have a management board with Amanda Boone's on a member on our management board and then a policy board. And that has included uh, in the past Mike Moran, who's represented Sarasota County and uh, now uh, Commissioner Nunder. So the presentation I'm giving is not just Dave's view of how the world works. That we've actually vetted this through our citizens advisory committee, our technical advisory committee, because uh, we want feedback before we present something to you. Because I think this presentation is going to have parts that are going to irritate one half of the audience and then it's going to shift and it's going to irritate the other half of the audience because that's just the way it is. And um, we're not actually, we don't have a dog in this fight. We're here to help you work through whatever it is, decisions you want to make. So my presentation isn't just about Little Sarasota Bay and Midnight Pass. It's about the broader topic of the health of Little Sarasota Bay, but also tidal restoration projects. You know. Where are they done? Why do you do them? And, and is it appropriate in Little Sarasota Bay? And uh, without further delay, let me get going on this. So um, you guys have seen versions of this photography, and that is, you know, from the 1970s. Uh, it's a photo that's taken south of Midnight Pass, looking to the north. To the left-hand side, you've got the Gulf of Mexico. To the right-hand side, you've got Little Sarasota Bay. And connecting the two is, little, is Midnight Pass. And that island that's uh, there on on the inside of Midnight Pass uh, in Little Sarasota Bay is the Jim Neville Preserve. It's called Bird Key, uh, that sort of thing. So that's what this pass was like. And then we have an excellent drone pilot uh, who shoots photography. And they took that picture on the right, almost the same angle, but uh, in August of 2022. So this is during the wet season of 2022. And yet you can see there's an awful lot. There's no connection between the two. but. This has been interpreted by some as the murky waters of Little Sarasota Bay, but as a marine biologist who used to be a commercial fisherman, I can tell you what I see there is a lot of mangroves and a lot of seagrass. I can see to the bottom of that channel right there. This is a system that has healthy habitats in it. It doesn't mean that there's nothing that should be or could be done, but there's an awful lot of important stuff that you can see right there, and we're going to talk about you know, the important uh, habitat features of Little Sarasota Bay. So you see that kind of darker signature in the bottom, that's seagrass meadows, and they're all over the place. There's hundreds of acres of seagrass that have to be considered with whatever it is that you decide to move forward with. So we've, uh, and when you see a, a name like D1992, that reflects like a paper that was done in 1992. All the information we have is gonna be available on our website, sarasotabay.org, visit us, anyway, but uh, visit us if you want to and go to the technical library and you can see research that dates, dates back, you know, 30 years on Little Sarasota Bay and water quality and seagrasses and fish and everything like that. So 
Um, there has been a connection between Little Sarasota Bay and the Gulf of Mexico that dates back to the 1800s. Um, the, the names of these things are usually like Blind Pass, Midnight Pass. There's passes all over the place that are named after oh, it occurred overnight, so I'm going to call it Midnight Pass. The pass that existed in the 1880s was called uh, Blind Pass, and it was located all the way up by Point of Rocks, much farther north than that. And you see that kind of long channel that goes up to it? That's the migration of that pass. Passes have migrated up and down this island for 100 years. Um, and in 1921, Hurricane, we actually had two passes for a while. We had Blind Pass, and then we had what was then called Musketeer Pass, later it becomes known as Midnight Pass. Uh, three years later, in 1924, Blind Pass is closed, and that channel that used to go up to that pass is now Heron Lagoon. Um, so in the 1940s, you still had this pass. The pass is migrating north and south, uh, up and down. But in 1984, it, there's no longer a pass because in 1984, it was closed. Uh, excuse me, it was closed in, in, in the, I don't know if it was in the December of 83 or 84. I know it was closed in 84. Um, and it was closed by bulldozers. So it wasn't, maybe it was gonna close with a storm, maybe not, but it was closed by bulldozers. So this is very different kind of a, a scenario than a pass that actually closes because a storm comes through. Uh, so it was closed by bulldozers because the pass started to migrate and started to affect people's property. Just like that it has been doing it for 100 years, but you had a tidal connection for more than 100 years, but you haven't had one for the last 40 years. Now, one of the neat things, and I think, uh, uh, Spencer brought this up uh, last time. One of the first things that, that was done, I was a scientist for the Sarasota Bay program 30 years ago, and what we did is we did a calibrated three-dimensional hydrodynamic model for all of Sarasota Bay, which meant that we actually had instrumentation out in the bay to measure the tides, the currents, the salinity, and compare that against what the model said, because you can only model you can only calibrate a model for existing conditions. And then once you have a good model, where good, a good fit with what the model predicts and what you measure, then you can play around with different scenarios. Then you can say, what would happen if I didn't have the intercoastal waterway? What would happen if I reopened Midnight Pass? So a calibrated model 30 years ago is probably one of the better ones around. This is by Peter Shang, University of Florida. Like he's the best known hydrodynamic modeler in the state of Florida. And uh, so one of the questions would be, when this pass closed, what was the effect on water circulation in Little Sarasota Bay? And the answer to that is by comparing those two numbers in the red boxes, 27 and 74. And what that means is that the numbers represent the amount of water that's exchanged over a 10-day period. So the closure of that pass changed the water exchange from an average of 74% to 27%. So there's a two-thirds reduction in water circulation because of the closure of that pass. And that's important. But as Spencer talked about earlier, um, when you open up a pass or close a pass, there's changes in other areas. So when water comes into Little Sarasota Bay right now, it doesn't come in from the west, the north, and the south. It comes in only from the north and the south. And so what happens now is the water that comes into Little Sarasota Bay in a high tide is coming predominantly from the north, from the Big Pass, New Pass complex. So with the the closure of that pass as the water went from 74 to 27 in Little Sarasota Bay, it increased in Roberts Bay. So Roberts Bay now is better flushed because it's the way for water to come into Little Sarasota Bay. It's not winners and losers, it's just that's the way it is. The water that used to be better flushed in Little Sarasota Bay is now not as well flushed. The water in Roberts Bay is now better flushed. There's more water exchange in Roberts Bay, and that means whatever comes down um, Philippi Creek on an incoming tide will come into Little Sarasota Bay. So the problems that we had with wastewater overflows that are being addressed were affecting Little Sarasota Bay because that water gets advected to the south on an incoming tide. Now, one of the other questions that's really important is, what did the Intracoastal Waterway do to water circulation? This is a little bit different than saying did it or did not have an effect on the past, but if we look at the the effect of the Intracoastal Waterway, those answers are, are a given here by comparing the numbers in the circles. So for example, the Intracoastal Waterway, if we look at Blackburn Bay, the construction of the Intracoastal Waterway changed the water exchange from 70% to 83% exchange over a 10 day period. Because think about Blackburn Bay, it's proximity to Venice Inlet. Venice Inlet wasn't always the way it is. Uh, Venice Inlet used to be called Casey's Pass. But as part of the Intracoastal Waterway construction, which was completed in about 1964, Venice Inlet and all the modifications makes Blackburn Bay better flushed. 
But if you look at Little Sarasota Bay, those numbers are 71 and 74. And what it suggests is that the Intracoastal Waterway might not have had that big of a difference on the circulation in Little Sarasota Bay. And that actually is really important. It needs to be verified with a new model. But what that suggests is it maybe isn't that critical to make a connection to the Intracoastal Waterway to get water exchanged because it doesn't suggest that uh, the Intracoastal Waterway doomed this pass to failure. And it could be that it's more subtle than that, but that's an important thing to verify because if the Intracoastal Waterway doomed this pass to failure, the picture we just showed you was from 1970s. There was a pass that was going there, and that was probably you know at least six years afterwards. The pass was open for 20 years after the last part of the ICW construction, which is in 1964. So it might have an effect, but it might not have been that big of an effect. It's something to verify, but the Intercoastal Waterway might not necessarily have doomed this pass to closure, because if it did, it took 20 years. That's kind of like a slow doom, if you would. And that could be a very important feature in terms of like, what do I need to do to reestablish a tidal connection in that system? So with that as a background, uh, what is the estuary program's role? First off, we're not a regulatory agency. We're not gonna sign or deny a permit because that's not our role. We don't have that role. We try to like be a locally sourced, scientifically driven management you know, entity to tell people what kind of things make sense or not. Um, we can't be a significant funding source. We have money that we spend on public outreach and education, habitat restoration. Uh, we do have like about $2.7 million that we're gonna be spending over the next three years on things like the fish preserve, on, on habitat restoration, stormwater projects, but not this amount of money, because this is gonna cost a lot. Um, we can't be a sponsor of a permit. We can't sign off on it because we're not, we're a special independent district. We could go away. And so whoever signs this permit is gonna have to be responsible for the design, the permitting, construction, and all the permit obligations, which are gonna be decades into the future, not years in the future. You, whatever you do, you're gonna to have to like be responsible for it for I think probably decades, more than years. Um, but what we can be is an honest broker of information because uh, literally, um, Whatever, we're not gonna tell you you have to do this, we're not gonna tell you you can't do this. We're here to try to provide information for the people who have to make the decision about it. So what kind of problems exist that really probably aren't due to tidal uh, restoration, uh, that aren't related to the, the tidal mixing? And what problems do exist? Because not everything in Little Sarasota Bay that's a problem is because of the lack of water, uh, the lack of tidal influence. But there are some things that do happen that can't be fixed unless you have a tidal restoration project. And the other part of it is, tidal restoration is actually a pretty common project done all throughout the United States and overseas as well. I've worked on three projects like this, and all of them have been designed, permitted, two of them are already constructed. One of them went from concept to construction in five years. For 40 years, you've not been able to get over this, and I mean you as the general sense. And I think that there's ways that we can actually make this a little bit easier the next time you go through with it by learning from what didn't work, and also paying attention to the places where they have been able to do this. Because this is actually the kind of stuff that people have been doing for a long time in lots of different places. And there's a couple of them I'm gonna go through examples of. Uh, and then one of the most important things is, you know, don't go down this pathway, hire a consultant. I spent half my life in the private sector, uh, half my career. And like, you know, you don't wanna just trust someone's telling you that it's gonna be easy to get your permits. This is not gonna be easy to get permits. Someone who says it's easy or, or I'm confident I can get permits, you might wanna run away because the reality is it's gonna be difficult, but there are things that are gonna make it much more difficult in other ways. So the project design of getting your tidal restoration can help you determine whether or not you're gonna get your permits or not. 15 years ago, you weren't successful. And if you go down that same pathway as you did 15 years ago, you'll probably end up just as successful as you were 15 years ago, which is you're not gonna get your permits. So maybe do things differently, perhaps. So one of the big issues is water quality. And if you're a proponent of opening the pass, don't call this water quality horrible and talk about it like the bay is dead and we need to flush it out in the Gulf of Mexico. That's not true and it's not helpful, all right? The more you talk about this water quality like it's some gross toilet that needs to be flushed, the fewer friends you're gonna have because it's gonna be basically saying, okay, you can't deal with your stormwater and your wastewater, so you just wanna dump it in the Gulf of Mexico and make the next red tide worse? I don't think so. That's not the story of Little Sarasota Bay. The reality is, Sarasota Bay as a whole and Little Sarasota Bay as well is better than it was five years ago, with the exception of Ian, what Ian did to us, but it's not as good as it was 10 to 15 years ago. 
So you guys pay for data collection, use it, because it helps make a good story for you. Um, so these two graphics are water quality data. You've paid Moat Marine Lab to go out and collect. They're, they're sampled. Sarasota County does it differently than Mantee County. Mantee County collects their own data. But those blue dots represent an annual average. The left-hand graph is nitrogen. The right-hand graph is the amount of algae in the water. And the red line represents a two-point moving average, so it's the general trend. And what you can see is that the nitrogen, you don't want a lot of nitrogen in your bay. Uh, the nitrogen peaked around 2016. The last five years, until Ian, your water quality was getting better. And it's getting better, but not as good as it was 10, 15 years ago. But your worst water quality is not now. Your worst water quality was a couple of years ago. 2018's red tide occurred during the peak year for wastewater overflows. And those wastewater overflows are not happening. You're spending hundreds of millions of dollars on wastewater, infrastructure, stormwater, habitat restoration, public education, the wet season fertilizer ban, and it is working. We are seeing improvements. So that nitrogen trend was going down for five years. And the 20% reduction in nitrogen on the left-hand graph, look on the right-hand graph, that's a 50% reduction in the amount of algae. So yeah, our algae levels in the bay are not where we want them to be, but your worst water quality is not now. It was about five years ago because you're doing the right things to improve water quality. The bay has a lot of features that are important to consider, and one of them is seagrass meadows. So the graphic on the left represents the amount of seagrass in Little Sarasota Bay, the way we define Little Sarasota Bay, uh, and the dark green represents dense seagrass meadows, dense seagrass meadows. The light green represents sparse, and the graphic on the right represents the overall pattern of seagrass over the last 30 years. There's 600 acres of seagrass meadows in Little Sarasota Bay, uh, most of it is clustered around the Jim Neville Preserve. That is the area where if you just decide you're gonna put a channel right through the middle of it and not really care that much about seagrass and mangroves, that's gonna be a lot of pushback from a lot of people. So there's a lot of habitat that has to be taken into consideration on there. The seagrass coverage in Little Sarasota Bay is 600 acres, but it's down 30%. And that is a concern. But that 30% reduction is a 30% loss of an increase that occurred while the pass was still closed. So the pass is not the reason why that seagrass loss occurred because that pass was still closed while the increase occurred. What we think is happening there is the general effect of the water quality problems that we had on Little Sarasota Bay. And then the recovery of Little Sarasota Bay's water quality we think is gonna stop that deterioration. So this is not the Indian River Lagoon. It's not an accelerating loss. We had that loss and now it's kind of plateauing out and we want to get that gain back, but at least we're not continuing to lose seagrass. Um, having that much seagrass um, loss is not unique to Little Sarasota Bay either. Uh, the graphic on the right shows the amount of seagrass coverage throughout the bay as a whole and it's down 28% from its peak. That's about the same level of decrease in Tampa Bay. That's similar to what we're seeing in Charlotte Harbor. So losing seagrass in Little Sarasota Bay is not because of the past being closed, we're seeing that all over the place. We're seeing it because we think our wastewater and stormwater infrastructure was just not up to the population growth and the fact that our water is getting warmer. And so all these things combined represent situations that are important, but they're not unique to Little Sarasota Bay, the loss of seagrass. So you can't just say, I lost seagrass, you need to open a pass. There are other things that are important, but it's not just the general, I lost seagrass, I need to do something about the pass. Having that much seagrass, you'd expect there to be a lot of fish. And this is probably one of the more controversial things, but Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission biologists come down and sample the fish population in Sarasota Bay, Tampa Bay, Charlotte Harbor. They've been doing it for years. And this is a 2021 report for the year 2020. We actually have a more recent one. Makes the same point. Um, so they've sampled with three different gear types. 208 stations throughout Sarasota Bay, 34 in Little Sarasota Bay. If we take the number of fish divided by the sampling effort, Little Sarasota Bay was second only to Palmasola Bay as the number of fish. There are plenty of fish in Little Sarasota Bay. There's probably over 10 million fish, but they're small. And we've known this for 30 years. Little Sarasota Bay is a nursery. And some people might say, well, I don't care about little fish. I wanna catch big fish. If you wanna catch big fish, you gotta care about where they were little because Big fish don't become big until they were little first. So the nursery habitat that Little Sarasota Bay is producing is something that is going to be taken into account by the people that need to sign off on your permits. So ignore it if you want, 
think that little fish don't care. There are going to be people that sign off on permit that are going to care about this. This information is out there. They're going to know it as much as we know it. So there are important habitat functions in there. So what does this mean about the bay? Is it dead? It is not dead. Don't use that language. It doesn't help you. If you want to do a tidal restoration project, it's not accurate. It's not helpful. Um, but we're going to talk about it. There are problems that exist in Little Sarasota Bay that probably can only be addressed by increasing the tidal uh, connection with the Gulf of Mexico. And it's not that controversial of a project. It's done all over the place. We're going to walk you through a couple of examples. So there are reasons to, to basically say Little Sarasota Bay is a, a, a system provides a lot of value, but it's not that it doesn't have a problem that would benefit from having a tidal reconnection. And we're going to talk, now we're going to switch to irritating the other half of the audience. So um, half of my career has been in the private sector. And one of the neat things is I didn't just work on Sarasota Bay. And one of the best projects I had to work on was a project in Puerto Rico in San Juan Bay Estuary. And uh, my job was to try to determine the ecological benefits, water quality and habitat, of reconnecting San Jose Lagoon, which is in the middle with San Juan Bay proper, which is to the left on the west side of that. So this is a little bit, if you squint your eyes, it's a little bit like Little Sarasota Bay. San Jose Lagoon is not connected to the Atlantic Ocean. It's connected to water bodies that are themselves connected to the Atlantic Ocean. A little bit like how Little Sarasota Bay isn't connected to the Gulf, but it's connected to water bodies that are themselves connected. And so the Kenya Martin Pena, the Martin Pena Canal, has closed up over the last couple of decades, and my job was to try to determine what would happen if we reestablish the tidal connection between San Jose Lagoon and San Juan Bay proper by that canal off to the left-hand side. And what we found is something that was by itself enough to get us the permits for the construction of this $200 million project, because this is miles long. This isn't like a 200-foot distance, which is what you have. This is a couple miles. And so what we found is this thing called salinity stratification and bottom water hypoxia. And what that means is that when freshwater inflow comes in, rainy season or tropical storm, if the water body isn't that well mixed, what we saw in San Jose Lagoon is the water stayed kind of like stratified. So this fresher water is on top of the saltier water underneath. And the water underneath doesn't get oxygen from the atmosphere because it's kind of isolated. It doesn't get oxygen from photosynthesis because it's very dark because it's got this tanniny water on top of it. And when that happens, everything in the bottom of San Jose Lagoon basically dies. And it's got very poor habitat quality. And you can't fix that with wastewater upgrades or stormwater retrofits because like Little Sarasota Bay, San Jose Lagoon's water was getting better, but we still had this because this is a physical process. It's not pollution related. And so the idea of like this happened in Puerto Rico, reconnecting it to uh, the other systems would be in itself enough of a reason to get the permits for doing this important project where we had oversight from EPA, Army Corps of Engineers, Puerto Rico Department of Environmental Quality, National Marine Fisheries Service, a whole lot of people that were looking over our shoulders on this, and we got the permits. So would something like this happen in Little Sarasota Bay? And the answer is, yeah, it looks like it did happen. So. When Hurricane Ian came through, your staff was busy doing a lot of stuff because of the physical damage to your community. And so uh, the Sarasota Bay Estuary Program, Jay and Megan sitting in the audience and, and a water management district staff, we went out and we took over sampling water quality to look at what was the impact of Ian on water quality. High bacteria levels, high nutrients, high algae and everything like that. Uh, we sampled three spots in Blackburn Bay, three in Little Sarasota Bay, three in Roberts Bay, and we did it three times, one week after Ian, two weeks after Ian, four weeks after Ian. And what we found is that if we look at stratification is the high number means there's a big difference between the top salinity and the bottom salinity. The highest valley was in Little Sarasota Bay. That doesn't get the most freshwater inflow. Roberts Bay does. Yet the stratification was strongest in Little Sarasota Bay and the oxygen was lowest. So stratification and low oxygen that we saw in San Jose Lagoon that also happens in Little Sarasota Bay, and it lasted at least two weeks. It didn't last four weeks, but it lasted at least two weeks. We don't know exactly how often it happens, but when it does happen, if you're a big fish, you just swim away. If you're a little fish, you die. If you live on the bottom of the lagoon, you're not gonna make it. So if you're a starfish, if you're a clam, if you're a worm, you don't have oxygen for two weeks, you're not gonna make it. And so this happens only in Little Sarasota Bay. And you can't fix it with wastewater, you can't fix it with stormwater. It's a tidal restoration project. So. 
With that, now we're gonna talk about title restoration projects. And the thing that I think has been missing in the past from some of your applications is not a, there's not been a lot of reason to suggest that good things will happen. And good things probably will happen if you do this, if you uh, look at the past experience of other locations. So I'm gonna go over a couple of examples that I'm familiar with because I worked on them. And there's more than what I've worked on, obviously, but I'm gonna give you a couple. And they're gonna be different than what exists here, but the main point is, let the science tell you the problem that needs to be fixed. Don't just assume that there's a one size fits all, but the, the, the thing that exists in Little Sarasota Bay is different than some of the issues in other locations, but there is some reason why title restoration would make sense. Let the science tell you what makes sense and then follow that to, to make the argument that you need to do something to fix that particular issue. So the first example I'm gonna give is a 300 acre uh, lagoon called Lake Surprise. It's not a freshwater lake, it's down in Key Largo. And uh, Henry Flagler built a, a causeway and it divided Lake Surprise into two parts. And they've been isolated from each other uh, for 100 years. And in 2008, that causeway was removed. And my job was to try to figure out what would be the system response to the removal of a, two, of a 100 year old causeway that would allow water to move back and forth. And there were a lot of concern. People were thinking, oh my God, this is gonna be a bad idea. Why would we think water quality would get better? And we didn't know. So we started to just monitor it. So we developed what's called a before and after control and impact study. It's kind of like doing a medical study where you have a placebo, right? And so we looked at water quality. I'm gonna show you one graphic from it, and that is phosphorus. You guys, your algae grows because you add nitrogen. Down there, algae grows if you add phosphorus. So we're gonna look at phosphorus, and we're gonna look at it what it was before, during the construction and afterwards. And the blue and the pink lines represent the values. The blue line represents uh, the control site where we didn't do anything. The pink line represents the site where we took out a 100-year-old causeway. And notice how they kind of match each other. A lot of variability, you know, it's not like a static system. But after the causeway removal, which is in a bracket, the lines separate and they stay separate. And what we saw is a phosphorus reduction, the nutrient of concern, of 50% that we didn't see in the other area. The water quality across 300 acres improved. We didn't do anything with wastewater, didn't do anything with stormwater. We just reestablished tidal connection. Water quality will get better in a place where you allow the water to exchange the way it used to before humans did something like put in a 100-year-old causeway. The next project, this is a neat one because this went from concept to construction in five years. So this was myself and an engineer at a company I used to work for called Atkins. Uh, and we had this idea about a part of Tampa Bay that had a problem that wasn't gonna be fixed with wastewater and stormwater. We thought this was due to circulation. So on the left-hand side, this is a, a aerial photo looking towards the west. In the lower right-hand corner of that photo is about where Tampa International Airport is. So this is a causeway that was built there in the 1930s, it existed for 80 years. And that red arrow points to where this bridge is. And that bridge is a $20 million bridge. And it was put in there for the environmental benefit of an area that was not no circulation, but reduced circulation. And the reason why we did that is not because the water was gross and it was horrible, it was because the salinity was too low and too variable. And the reason why that was an impact is because the science told us it adversely affected seagrasses. So this is different than what you have, but it's a reason to just follow the science of what is the problem that can be solved. And so this graphic right here shows four different areas where we're trying to represent the persistence of seagrass meadows over time. So we map seagrass 13 times. And if we see seagrass in, on a pixel basis, every single time, it's gonna be painted bright green. If we only map seagrass one time, it's gonna be bright red. And so the warmer the colors, the more ephemeral the seagrass meadows is. So the causeway, the, the location south of the causeway is bright green because we always found seagrass there. North of the causeway, the farther away you get from that circulation, the more ephemeral the seagrass meadows are. And that, the salinity and this map right here was all we needed to get permits for a uh, hydrologic restoration project. And we did it in five, five years. So, last example I'm gonna give you. This is also from Tampa Bay. Um, this is in, uh, if you ever drive down to Fort DeSoto, um, the arrow points to a bridge and when I, when I say the word culvert, this is what I mean. The culvert doesn't mean a pipe that a manatee can get stuck in. It doesn't mean pipes and, and electricity and pumps. It means a structure that can be concrete that allows water to move across a barrier. And so this 
culvert slash bridge was put in place and it allows water to move back and forth across an area of about 200 acres, similar to the project we just showed you. And the, the green is a dye uh, distribution study to show the water moving. And after this thing was done, this won an award in 2015. It got half its money from the water management district, the other half from Pinellas County. And the ecosystem responses were no water's pumped, there's not a huge head difference between these two locations, and yet the water velocity increased. We saw an increase in the type of seagrass that requires better water quality. We see increase in snook, redfish, and nurse sharks. This is all documented as well. So kind of pulling it all together, you know, your bay is not dead. Don't call it that. It doesn't, you know, the most important thing you have is your credibility. For permitting agencies, if you exaggerate how bad it is or how good it is, you're gonna, they're gonna view you with skepticism. The bay is different than what it used to be, but it does have problems. It's got that salinity stratification, bottom water hypoxia, that no other part of our bay has uh, the way it had there. And so when Ian comes through, or perhaps when you get a strong, you know, uh, a summer uh, rainstorm, uh, you know, maybe a couple inches, the bottom of that uh, bay does not have oxygen and pretty much big fish move away, everything else probably dies in place. That's a big issue. You can't fix it with uh, uh, wastewater and stormwater. So there are problems that exist that have nothing to do with the past, and there are problems that exist that can't be rectified unless you do something to exchange water. So that kind of gets to my second to last slide, which is if you move forward with this, and again, we're not gonna tell you what to do. We're here to provide support for you in whatever determination you make. If you decide to have a wild pass, it will move. It's been the history. I mean, the passes have moved all the way up to like Point of Rocks. Clam Pass in Collier County is a pass that I've worked on, um, and that thing is maintained by Collier County, connection between Outer Clam Bay and the Gulf of Mexico. They've had to dredge it several times. They've had to dredge it more than once in a year. So a wild pass is not gonna necessarily stay the way you dug it, and that's one of the lessons learned. Um, supposing you decide you're gonna do something and I'm gonna keep it open with jetties, all right? Because that's been brought up before. The picture on the right-hand side there shows Venice Inlet looking kind of from the southwest towards the northeast. So that boat is coming in from the Gulf of Mexico. And what you notice there is on the north side of that jetty, look at the beach, and then look at the lack of a beach on the south side of the jetty. Your predominant nearshore current here is north to south because you get a sea breeze coming out of the west and you have the Coriolis effect that gives you a, a rightward deflection. So if you put in a jetty and you live north of it, you might be thrilled. If you live south of it, and that's Casey Key, they don't have an awful lot of sand to lose, and this would possibly be an issue for them. It would certainly be an issue for sea turtles. That's gonna be an issue for permitting. Losing a beach on the south side of a jetty is gonna be a big issue. Um, so what's left? Well, there's other different things that you could do, but one of them that I think is worth considering is looking at some sort of like culvert. Look at something that's not a wild pass, it's not a jetty. And because these sort of things have been done in other areas. I have no idea, I'm not a hydrodynamic modeler, I'm not a, uh, coastal engineer, but I've worked on places where they've used things like this. Florida Keys has plenty of tidal restoration projects done with culverts. It's not a pass, it's not a jetty, it's just basically a way for water to move from one side to the other. That project in Fort DeSoto, that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. I have no idea if it would work or not, but it has worked in other locations. And one of the most important things is for you to Basically, whatever pathway you move forward with, get together with those permitting agencies right away. Don't spend hundreds of thousand dollars, plop down a plan, and then find out afterwards, I'm not gonna be able to permit this. Meet with them up front. Find out what kind of things are likely to happen, what kind of things could happen, and what kind of things are just, mm -mm, it's not gonna happen. And, and spend your money wisely in that way would be my suggestion. Consultants that tell you this is gonna be easy, consultants that say, don't worry about it, I'm confident I can get it, I was in consulting. You know what, that's how you get your money, but that's not necessarily how you be successful for your client. Uh, and then, just want to end up with the last thing. These kind of things are all over the place. Tidal restoration um, gives a pretty quick positive system benefit. Our technical advisory committee does not have a whole lot of people that think it's a bad idea to restore tidal connection, but it does have a couple people that would not be in favor of some of the more destructive ways that could be done to reestablish the tidal connection. So this kind of thing is done all over the place. There's plenty of examples uh, in the literature all over the place. And uh, with that, I will just shut up and answer any questions you might have. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you. We have a couple of questions for you, I'm sure. Uh, we'll start with Commissioner Nunder. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> um, thank you, Dr. Dave. Uh, appreciate your time. Um, 
And over the course of the last several months, I've certainly enjoyed our conversations and your expertise uh, to this situation. Um, I guess a little history during my campaign, this, this came on my radar in June. And so since that time and since being elected, uh, I appreciate Jonathan and his staff uh, for acquiescing to my requests about the history here uh, as it pertains to, um, in this case, it will be the Little Sarasota Bay water quality or perhaps even uh, historical tidal restoration processes. And I think you are absolutely right on point when you speak about the way that we go through the process for the permitting the time uh, it's going to be that is going to be required in order to check with the DEP, uh, all the regulatory agencies that will come into this equation to make sure that we're on the right page. Um, I think as a matter of this iteration, uh, as you're well aware, um, we seem to have some buy-in from stakeholders uh, at a state and national level that perhaps weren't there before that could help us with this situation and perhaps advocate for it a little better. Um, and by no means am I saying that we go fast on this. We definitely need to follow the science and rely on the experts uh, to give us the right direction um, for this particular product. And so a couple of, um, couple of sayings that I heard out of, your, out of your presentation here for the second, third time, I think, I'm not sure now, but you know, the uh, salinity stratification and hypoxia, uh, anybody that kind of dives into the biology background and knows environmental science would tell you that's, that's, a, that's a nail in the coffin for a lot of species. So I think uh, the experts, we should ask them sufficiently, uh, what are their thoughts on natures that present with hypoxia and, and solidity stratification? Um, and so the two-thirds reduction in flow that you had also mentioned, I think it would be important, um, and hopefully we get some monies allocated through this session in our legislature to go ahead and spend that money wisely to see exactly what we're dealing with. Um, this iteration needs to be slow, well thought out. I believe we should measure twice and cut once. Um, as a young child, I do remember seeing the bumper stickers, let it flow, open midnight pass. In fact, I believe I have one uh, in my room at my parents' house. It's still there in the back. So that's that's how near and dear this particular subject matter is to this community. Um, I, I think this is a great project. I, I, I've been on board since summer. I, I think that it behooves us all to look at something that improves perhaps the water quality, always water quality here. We're a coastal community. Um, but more important than that too, we want to make sure that we're, we're going slow. Uh, and we're relying on the experts like yourself to give us the best quality information uh, possible to make a decision. And I think certainly that starts hopefully with appropriations from our legislature uh, to acquire some funds to then go ahead and start doing some studies to see if this is feasible. Um, I know I'm on board for that. I'll be listening to my colleagues on the board. Um, but thank you for your time. Thank you for your service. And I'll see you at the next meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner Smith. Thank you, Doctor, for, for being here today. Appreciate it. And um, my own experience um, of getting permits uh, with Sarasota County, uh, I've always found it better to uh, meet uh, with, the, um, with the reviewers and the uh, zoning and what have you, uh, sometimes with my client, because I found that they're always uh, more amicable to my client than they were to the architect. But... Uh, but uh, also getting a temperature uh, for the room and also to know exactly what they're looking for and what would be acceptable. So I think your strategy's uh, right on on that. Um, uh, the, the structural uh, aspect of uh, getting that title exchange <clears throat> I think is fascinating. Um, and that... Um, uh, and how how we go about that, and um, but I'm I'm um, totally on board with following the science, and um, and whatever we, or however we we uh, make this uh, happen, one way or the other, um, I would like to see it as sustainable as possible, uh, with the least amount of maintenance and and impact, um, other than. Personally, I, I think the title, uh, some title action there, it would be beneficial to the Bay. Um, 
just from what I'm hearing from, again, the, the folks that are the captains on Siesta Key that, that do the fishing, um, they're not looking for little fish. They're looking for bigger fish, yeah. as you can imagine. Yeah. Uh, so but, am I. <laughs> but, but, but we all understand you, you can't get big fish without the little yeah. fish. So, uh, but anyway, I appreciate your presentation. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Any other uh, commissioners? Um, I do have a question. Um, this pass closed 40 years ago, and we keep referring to it as a uh, restoration. It, if, if a pass been, has been closed that long, is it would it and does it matter? I mean, when you're coming for permitting, if it seems to me that if you're going to reopen a pass that existed, there might be more you know, understanding of, okay, we want to just bring it back to its natural state, but is 40 years take it out of that historical designation or not? That's a, that's a good point. And that is, you know, um, so the project in Key Largo, that was, that was getting rid of a hundred year old impediment okay. to circulation. And the one down up in uh, old Tampa Bay was getting rid of an 80 year old. So uh, the easiest way to kind of figure out what should I do in restoration? Cause you know, rather than rely upon really complex models, the easiest way to do is just try to undo the dumb things that we did in the past. So, you know, uh, stormwater uh, over drainage of our landscape and, and, you know, pollutant discharges from wastewater treatment plants. You guys are spending a lot of money to address that. That's why your water quality is getting better uh, until Ian came through. But, you know, hurricanes are going to adversely impact water quality, whether someone lives in the watershed or not. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Let's put Ian, you know, to the side and look at your general trend the last couple of years was in a positive direction. You should be proud of that. You spent a lot of money, you're getting a result on it. But the fact that it's been uh, isolated for 40 years, I don't think that's a deal breaker. I mean, yeah. if that was the case, we could make the same argument, Lake Surprise, don't get rid of it, it's been there for 100 years. Or the one in Tampa Bay, that's been there 80 years. So what? It's an artificial impediment to circulation. Let's try to re, that's the easiest way to identify restoration opportunities is try to fix the thing that we did and that was closed with bulldozers that's an important point that's an important point for getting permits you're not going to get a permit to put in a pass where one didn't used to exist and it might be difficult to get a permit to uh put in a pass if something was closed by a storm this was closed by bulldozers i mean there's pictures of it i've seen them so this is one of the key parts why this is different than other areas is the human role in reducing that circulation and the fact that they're they're fixed they were never permitted to close the pass they were permitted to relocate the pass mm -hmm. part of that was closing the other one reopening it and they were, they never met their permit obligations from 40 years ago no i understand and I, it's you know it's, it's it is an interesting and a unique situation for sure and especially now because i hear you saying several times don't say it's dead i mean yeah it you know it's some not true conditions it's not have changed yeah and, uh, that's important but in your, your examples, I'm wondering, you know, it seems like when we try to fix things, sometimes we make them worse. And I, I'm not speaking to this case, but I'm just, you know, the law of unintended consequences. I know we're working on the whole red tide thing, and the biggest concern is we can kill it, but we want to make sure that we don't kill everything else. And how do we do it in a way that doesn't harm others, and we end up with, you know, the solution ends up causing us more problems down the road. And I'm wondering, do you have... In your in your presentation, um, is any of these projects similar in the sense that if we open up Midnight Pass and that water flow begins to affect other inlets, like the Venice Inlet, and stuff, do we have a project that sort of can identify? You know, will we be dredging Venice Inlet more often because it's not has the you know we we reduce the flow out of the inlet? Yeah, I'm, I'm not comparable. qualified to answer that okay. one. I do think you can find people, the combination of coastal yeah. engineers and hydrodynamic modelers can okay. answer, because that is a really important question. And, and we don't want to say there's winners and losers with opening passes. You're just, again, you're reestablishing what used to exist. Mm -hmm. But you do bring up a point, which is, so, uh, you know, if you were to reestablish that tidal connection, I'm pretty confident, I'll bet my paycheck, yeah, your water quality will improve. Okay. Uh, every example I've worked on, that has been the case. Um, but with the exception of the following, which is if you have a red tide out in the Gulf of Mexico, right now, Little Sarasota Bay has it less than other areas because it's harder to get in there mm. and the salinity is lower. And red tide doesn't like really low salinity. So if you reestablish that connection, be careful what you ask for because you're mm. more likely to get red tide advected into Little Sarasota Bay. And red tide's not going away. Mm. Uh, we're 
We're making red tides worse across Southwest Florida by adding nutrients to it. And the biggest nutrient loading source that we have is Caloosahatchee River. There's nothing on the horizon that's gonna make a huge impact on the nutrient load coming out of the Caloosahatchee River. Uh, all the big projects we're talking about, hundreds of millions of dollars, they might reduce the nutrient load by less than 5%. So Caloosahatchee River is gonna continue to make red tides worse for the next mm. couple of decades. Wow. So that's just the way it is. And uh, so reopening that pass, you're gonna have better water quality. I'm, I'm almost positive of that. It's based on my experience and based on just some simple like, you know, relationships that we have. But with a red tide, you're probably gonna get red tide worse than you used to. In 2018, the lowest red tide we had in general was in Little Sarasota Bay. It was much higher in the saltier, better flushed portions of the upper part of the bay. Like think about how bad it was around St. Armand's. It wasn't nearly that bad in Little Sarasota Bay. Wow. Well, uh, if we learned anything today, we've got a long road ahead on this. If it was easy, it would have been done already. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I see no one else on the board. Uh, Mr. Tomasco, thank you so much for the presentation. Very informative, and uh, appreciate your help in this. Thanks for the time. Appreciate it. Call on us anytime. Okay, thank you.